assalamu alaikum girls uh, this is continuation of the previous lectures on uh, an apology for poetry by philip sydney today we are going to do the various kinds of poetry the four main objections that were raised against poetry and uh, sydney's answer to that and the last one is his critique over the drama and comedy of of his time uh, that basically became a reason for all the criticism that poetry was facing uh so this is the part of uh, the essay where he talks about the several kinds of poetry sydney now focuses attention on several kinds of poetry pastoral elegiac poetry and satiric poetry earlier he gave you different types of poetry in which uh, he said that uh, from the time immemorial poetry has been of three types the first one is uh, religious poetry the second is philosophic and the third is the rest of the types so this is the rest of the types the various other kinds of poetry that he is talking about so in this uh, the other kinds of poetry he has pastoral poetry elegiac poetry and satiric poetry according to sydney are all wholesome the pastoral poetry the first then he one by one he describes them and explains them the pastoral as the name suggests that it is regarded is related to pastor and ballads and different uh, events from the rural life the pastoral poetry treats of the beauty of simple life and sometimes the miseries of common people under lords and nobles so you are basically talking about shepherds and shepherdesses fishermen etc people from common way of life elegiac poetry is the number uh, second type of poetry that he mentions it deals with the weakness of mankind and the wretchedness of the world it evokes pity so you can say the elegiac poetry is basically sad poetry which deals with the miseries of mankind and how woeful human existence is so it's always sad as far as the tone is concerned so it is always filled with pity etc the third one is satiric poetry it laughs at folly and iambic poetry tries to unmask villainy so satiric poetry as the word satire is mentioned here satire were creatures which were half humans and half horses um, and um, even in the times of the greeks there were satire plays which were more like tragic comedies uh, they were a mixture of uh, the two genres so they laugh at folly and they also unmask the villainy so they were also written in iambic poetry so you can say that this is something that was taken from the greek time even in the greek time the satiric poetry was written in iambic meter so the third type of poetry that he discusses is the satiric poetry which is which later developed into comedy he lays undue stress on the moral aspect of comedy comedy is an imitation of the common errors of our life presented in a ridiculous manner it helps men keeping away from such errors so the basic uh, reason for writing comedies should not be just have a laughter or maybe laugh on the weaknesses of people but it should be to teach some lesson i mean sydney is all about the moral purpose of poetry whether it is drama whether it is tragedy whether it is comedy it should be teaching something some moral aspect to the uh, listeners or the viewers or the audience so basically the comedy should be aimed at keeping people away from such errors not just laughter tragedy is uh, replete with a sweet violence and it makes us remain grounded when we realize that life is full of uncertainties tragedy on the other tangent is a kind of a play that evokes pity and fear in us so we also look at these characters wretched and suffering on stage and we also realize that if we do the same thing same can happen to us so again there is a moral purpose to it the relic which gives moral precepts and soars to the heavens in singing the praises of the god can never be displeasing nor can the epic or heroic poetry be disliked because it inculcates virtue to the highest degree by portraying ho- heroic and moral goodness in the most effective manner sydney asserts that the heroical is not only a kind but the best and most accomplished kind of poetry so in one way he is giving you different types of poetry and he's again asking the question that how can these be bad how can you ban these from society when they are all aiming at the reformation they are all aiming at the improvement of human beings they are teaching something to human beings they have that teaching factor they have that moralistic factor in it how can something can be immoral if it as actually gives you all the morals uh, from human life so um, this is again his defense for poetry more like a stand that he takes that why poetry has to be safeguarded and propagated because it has a very uh, stark uh, very strict moral precept then we come to the four objections to poetry so the whole uh, 
work was aimed at this uh, just to repeat myself um, there was this person who wrote the book against poetry Gossen Stephen Gossen uh, the school of abuse and then he said that poetry should be banished because of these reasons after the general discussion on poetry Sidney now argues against specific critiques of poetry first poetry is useless a waste of time Second, poetry is deceptive, the mother of all lies. Third, poetry is immoral, the nurse of abuse. And the fourth is Plato would have none of it. So banish poets from his republic. In the answer of the first charge, Sidney argues that to call poetry useless is begging the question itself. So how can something be so useless if it is giving you so much? So these are the four objections. It is useless, it is falsehood, it is corrupting effect and Plato's condemnation of poetry. So then he answers, and this is more like his answer. Now let us put it in simple words, the statement that is by denouncing the mere prerequisite of the accusation, the poet attends to the state of a truth. It is itself valid. Poetry is not the falsest art. It is the truest form of art as it does not actually pretend to factual truth. So this whole thing has been taken from his uh, uh, work. Uh, the apology for poetry and you can use these yellow parts to actually quote from uh, the same uh, the astronomer the geometrician the historian the other all make false statements but while a poet is not a liar the immorality of poetry is actually its abuse so what he presents is not fact but fiction embodying truth of an ideal kind so here he answers uh, the allegation that it is all false he says that it has to be false because it is fiction the poet never says that he is giving you a fact the poet never says that he is giving you something that was totally true he tells you that it is a work of fiction so how can a work of fiction be called real so this is the perception that is wrong if rightly used poetry does most good in answer to the effeminizing effect sydney says that it is the stock abuse against learning uh, another abuse or another criticism against poetry was that it makes men effeminate means that it makes men womanly they become too emotional and they become too um, caught up in their uh, minds so men are supposed to go and fight in the battles men are supposed to do the hard things in life whereas poetry makes them more like women so they become very emotional and very soft poetry alone has the ability to rouse men to virtuous sex so he gives the example from from the past that poetry has caused people to go into wars, it gives them motivation, it gives them the valor, it gives them uh, motivation to go and fight. So how can you call something that has been there? I mean, whenever there was a battlefield, whenever there was a battle, there had to be poets who used to uh, sing poems and sing uh, poetry uh, to motivate the people to go into uh, the war. In Arabic, it is called Rijz. There were poets who, who were professionally uh, hired to uh, sing the poetry while there was a battle going on. So the people would become, the soldiers would become more courageous. The fourth and last accusation against poetry is perhaps the greatest treason, according to Sidney. He thinks Plato was against the wrong opinion of the gods and atheism, which poetry in ancient times talked of. According to Sidney, Plato was not against poetry in general, but he leveled his charges against a particular kind of poetry which would create a harmful effect on human minds and society in general. Po Plato was warned against the abuse of poetry as he, with all reverence, described the poet in Eon as the light-winged holy thing. So this is the last uh, objection in which uh, Gossen has said that if a philosopher like Plato has called um, the people of his time to ban poetry, there must be something really wrong in poetry and they, it should be banned. So Sydney is trying to um, reconstruct the meaning here by saying that Plato was not against poetry, but he was against bad poets. So uh, it's, it's a tool. Poetry can be used for good and poetry can be used for bad. So it is not the poetry itself that has to be blamed. It, it is the poet and their art that has to be blamed. If they are using it for lustful emotions, if they are using it for negative reasons, it is the poet who has to be blamed and not poetry itself. So he says the poet uh, Plato himself was a lover of poetry because in one of his uh, works he has described Eon, a very famous poet, as light winged holy thing. So if he is calling a poet something holy, something winged, something light, more like an angel, so how can he dislike poetry?
So this was uh, the uh, reason that was given. So as Plato banishing the abuse, not the thing, not banishing it, but giving due honor unto it shall be our patron and not our adversary. So again, this line is from uh, uh, the book, uh, his own words, the number 36. So you can use it as a quote. Now we come to the last topic that is Sydney's review of English poetry and drama. Uh, you need to understand that the basic criticism that poetry was facing in Sydney's time was because of this drama, because there were these tragic comedies on stage, uh, which used horrible level of poetry and it was lustful and it was um, immoral and it lacked purpose. So people were actually angry at these kind of stage plays that were going on in the time of Sydney. But what they actually could not understand was that it is not poetry itself that has to be blamed, but the dramatists who were using poetry in a very negative way. Uh, you need to remember that poetry here means everything that is written in verse, whether it is blank verse or whether it is any other rhyme or rhythm. So even drama comes under that. So it is more like a review about the pathetic state of poetry in England. He uses the term poetry in its original Greek sense. Remember, Aristotle has also used poetry when he talks about tragedy or comedy. So he does not differentiate uh, between the two. So similarly, Sydney here has used tragedy and comedy both under the title of poetry, which denotes not only poetry, but all sorts of imaginative literature like drama. So he believes that poetry encompasses everything that comes under the umbrella of imaginative literature. How he sadly recounts England's stepmotherly attitude towards the poet of his time, who unfortunately are ranked with the Montbanks, means quacks. He strikes at the root cause of this poetical decadence, the tendency of the poet to write uninspiring writing in Vita Minerva. Uh, it means that um, uh, he repeats the old tagline, a poet is born and not made. So he says that if the poets are not giving you good work, the poets are supposed to be blamed. That they, if they are writing without any help from Minerva, Minerva is the was a Greek goddess that used to inspire poets to write good poetry. So he said that if the poets are writing uninspiring poetry, uh, they are supposed to be blamed because a poet is born, not made. So even if you try and try, if you do not have the talent to write good poetry, you can never become a good poet. And then he goes on to say that a threesome combination of art, number one, imagination, number two, and exercise. Exercise here means practice goes on to make poetry successful. So now he's giving advice to poets or maybe people who want to be poets that there are three things that you need. Number one is art, that is inborn talent. You need to have that. Number two, imitation. You need to imitate any work. So you should be very clear about whether you are imitating drama, whether you are imitating epic, whether you are imitating comedy, what sort of imitation you are into. And the third thing is exercise, practice, 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 because the more you practice, the better you become. According to Sydney, since Chaucer, there are very few good poems in England. He mentions Chaucer's Trillus and Cressida, but sadly leaves out his Magnus Opus, the Canterbury Tales. So there are a little flaws because Chaucer is always remembered for the Canterbury Tales because that is the most famous work of Chaucer. But he mentions Trillus and Cressida, but he does not mention Canterbury Tales. He mentions Sackville, Surrey, Spencer, strangely, and very strangely, he, he ignores Langland, Spears, Plowman. So again, Pierce Plowman is again a very famous uh, work of poetry, but Sidney does not talk about that. He talks about Chaucer, but he talks about a lesser known work of Chaucer. However, this doomed state of drama is somehow redeemed by Gobadoc. Gobadoc was a play written by Thomas Norton and Thomas Sackville in 1561. So this was right before uh, Shakespeare was born. Uh, through this play, Though this play lacks the unity of time and space, Sidney prescribes that a tragedy should be tied to the laws of poetry and not of history. A dramatist should be should have the liberty to frame the history of his own tragical convenience. Furthermore, Sidney analyzes the tragedy is not always maintained in a well-raised admiration. So he believes that uh, people should read Aristotle and they should uh, be adhering to the unities of time and place because again, Gorbada was a play written did, which did not have the unity of place and time. He also believed that history and tragedy both be separated because tragedy is a work of art. It's an imaginative literature, whereas history cannot deviate for, from any kind of fact. So it has to be factual. Whereas in, tra in, in a tragedy, you can work your imagination, you, you can create your own reality. Uh, 
So he believes that good tragedians are needed to write good poetry. So finally, now he talks about comedy. He has uh, talked about tragedy and how people should differentiate between tragedy and history. Um, so a lot of um, things that he talk about are uh, not original. Uh, I told you earlier also that these um, principles that he discuss when he talks about poetry and history and history versus tragedy, they are not his own thinking. They are not his own points, but he has taken them from Aristotle and Horace for that matter also. But as far as the difference between tragedy and history is concerned, we have um, read about it in Aristotle's poetics. So he is taking it, borrowing the points from there. And even as far as comedy is concerned, he takes a definition from Aristotle. Comedy, on the other hand, degenerates into something farcical or immoral. Uh, remember, Aristotle also said that comedy is an imitation in which things and human beings are shown worse than they really are. So it is more farcical in, in as far as the application or imitation is concerned. Uh, but it should not be immoral. I mean, Im immorality should not be part of it. So that is where the problem was. Often laughter in comedy is confused with pleasure. Sydney stresses that comedy should aim at delightful teaching and not vulgar amusement. So he was against the slapstick comedy of his time. He was against the crude um, expression as far as poetry was concerned. He was against the immoral implication of poetry being used in comedy, um, which was uh, directed at very lustful, vulgar kind of amusement. So he believed that com comedy was not made for that. And again, you can see Aristotle being reflected here because Aristotle also differentiated between the painful and the laughable. So he also said that comedy should not be uh, something that uh, laughs at the weakness of a certain character. He, we should laugh at the follies um, uh, as far as the character is concerned. We should not uh, laugh at physical imperfections. If somebody is short-heighted or fat or blind or dark, etc., that is not something that should be the topic of comedy. But we should laugh at the weaknesses of character if somebody lies or if somebody cheats or if somebody is a villain we should laugh at that so people should uh, learn not to have those kind of characteristics in their personality neither is he hopeful about the english lyric poetry which has undergone degeneration and has become tame and artificial during his time so basically sydney is not very hopeful as far as the english poetry is concerned if you remember, I told you that English uh, for a very long time was not considered a fit language for poetry. People usually used to write poetry in French or Latin, etc. because they were considered the classical languages or they were considered the languages of the court. So English was considered too mainstream and too common a language to write poetry in. So he is a little apprehensive and he is a little worried where the English lyric poetry is going. And he is also worried because this is the reason why people were not happy with poetry and why people were saying that poetry should be banned because the poets were not doing a good job and they were not putting work and practice and hard work into creating good poetry. The affected eloquence has turned too fashionable. So there was this fashion of using very difficult language to express themselves and there was this fashion of thinking that if you use metaphors and conceits which are very difficult to understand your poetry is going to become better so the more complicated it is the better it is so that was the thinking which was actually affecting um, the spontaneous um, beauty of poetry because people could not understand what the poets were trying to say and it became very artificial and very superficial as far as the language is concerned in the next part of the essay, he praises the English language as it is the most suitable for poetry. It is adaptable both to ancient and modern systems of versification. Sydney bold view of English language has successfully paved its way for the future development. He comes to a closure with a peroration wherein he sums up the claims of poetry. So he believes that English language is fit for poetry. It is the best language for poetry because it is iambic in nature. It, it follows the sing song of the heart. So if you write in iambic meter, it completely com is compatible to the English language and it looks very natural. But the thing is, the quality of the poetry should be good. So as far as language is concerned, there is no uh, restriction. The English language is suitable to especially iambic poetry, but the quality of the content has to be good. Uh, so he at the end says that all the charges laid against it are false and baseless. He ends with a request that poetry should never ever be degraded. 
Moreover, the contemporary poets were inferior men with mercenary motives. So he believes that it is basically the poets who were to be blamed, not poetry, not the art, but the artist has to be blamed. They lack the genuine love for poetry. They also lack the training and the practice that is necessary to write successful poetry. He blesses people who love poetry and threaten people who are allergic to poetry in general. So he believes that uh, something that is a flaw of a poet should not be reflected back to the art of poetry. And he believes that the people who love poetry are genuine people and they are loving people. He love, He wrote the essay in the light-hearted manner. He gives an adequate answer to the Puritan approach of his age. The end too is humorous enough to make us fall in love with the poetry one more and behold Sidney as the first critic. So this is like the first uh, literary critical uh, work that was published in English language because before that we had works in Greek or Latin. Uh, but this was the first time that we have a printed work of criticism in English language. He also gives pointers to the poets. He gives them different hints and different ways to improve their art. And he also believes that the more practice they do, the better poetry they are going to write. And he believes that poetry has to have some kind of moralistic purpose. It should be, it should give you pleasure, but at the same time, it should teach you something good also. Teach and give pleasure. According to Sydney, these were the two main purposes of poetry. So he believed that the poets of his time, they were being lax and they were being lazy and they were the one who were doing a bad job. And because of that, the art should not be uh, criticized and it should not be abolished. It was the poets, they had to improve themselves and their art. So as far as the summary is concerned, let's sum up. Sydney's apology for poetry is more like a work of criticism. It's a work of literature also. Poetry is the mother of all knowledge. He believes that poetry is the most important thing as far as different kinds of knowledges are concerned. It is more important than science. It is more important than philosophy. It is more important than history. So like Aristotle, he also draws comparisons between all these different knowledge. And he says that poetry is better because it has something extra than all these other fields of knowledge. Poetry alone transcends nature. So as far as imitation is concerned, all art imitates nature, but poetry is something that transcends nature also. It gives you something extra. Plato is not against poetry. He warned against the abuse of poetry. So Plato, it is a misunderstanding that Plato in his Republic said that poetry should be banished. It was not the poetry that he basically uh, criticized. It was the wrong use of poetry. He was against badly written poetry. Because poetry is a very powerful tool and if you use it in a wrong way, the effects are going to be wrong. If you use it in a positive way, the effects are going to be positive because poetry has uh, a power of its own. So if you use it rhetorically, use karenge, so rhetoric can you know, convince people to do wrong things as well. But if you are going to use it for something nice, something like reformation or improvement of society, so the same thing can work wonders as far as uh, the improvement of society is concerned. There are questions. Uh, we start with short questions and then we have like a little bit longer questions and then very uh, short ones like four marks each. So they have to be really uh, short. So please go through them. If you do not understand any question, you can ask. Okay, because I'm going to give you the assignment questions after it. So with this, we finish the second topic. Uh, in the midterms, you are going to have Aristotle and Sydney. You are not going to have that schools of uh, um, criticism, socialism and biographical uh, criticism and, you know, other types of criticism. You're not going to have that, uh, but you are going to have Aristotle's poetics, 26 chapters. And then you are going to have questions from an apology for poetry uh, written by Philip Sydney. Thank you.